and tasty football. I think that's a nice touch. Ah, I like that as well. Okay, here we go, boys. And we'll do the big reveal in three, two, one. We're the top five biggest ranking changes in fantasy football drafts. Well, you better know. Everyone's either drafting right now like Matt Waldman is currently as we record this show, or you're going to be drafting this weekend. We are here for you, and Dr. Gene Brammel is here to talk about injury news and notes from around the National Football League. And, well, Gene, we've got a lot of guys getting banged up, coming back from being banged up. And I will start, because it is a Broncos show, with Cortland Sutton. He's going to play this week. He says it's a mental thing to get it off his mental checklist. Uh, I'm surprised he's playing, but how about you? I'm not too surprised. I think this is the week where you really expect expect folks to, if they feel like they need preseason snaps, they've got to get them in this week. If they feel like they need to do a little bit in practice before they start preparing for week one, we're going to see them this week. There's a long list of players that we're hearing coming back and hopefully confirming that their injuries were mild. I'm not too concerned about Sutton. We talked about him last week. You know, you'd ask me, when is he going to be able to jump? And I think a lot of that is going to depend on when he uh, gets a little bit of preseason repetitions that it's not against his own team and, and not an 11 on 11 drills and this is going to be a, a full contact full speed situation i'll give him a sense of where he is so um you know we've talked about this with joe burrow needing to feel like his legs are underneath him and take some reps and i think we're seeing the same thing with sutton so doc uh, no pitch count for dak prescott i guess we're staying with baseball since they had to consult with the rangers doctor what do we need to see to put him back where we had him before this injury or is he already there I think I think we're probably there at this point. I would like to see no setbacks, right? So um, the MRI a couple of weeks ago was a little bit concerning because it seemed odd. But then to have him already throwing immediately at the MRI tells you that maybe it just was a check-in situation and no pitch count, as you say, full 11-on-11 11 11 reps in in training camp practices this week is another good sign. So he needs to take contact a little bit. He needs to be confident that when he's in an uncertain situation, he can follow through with the ball. But it would really seem that most of what's going on is behind him. You think of at this point, he's been two, two and a half weeks into his throwing program and isn't at a high risk of aggravation. I don't think this is something that's likely to limit him. And hopefully you don't see any issues within this next week where he gets a little bit more of this practice time in and then he's ready to prepare for week one. So I, I don't think at this point, I think you can, you can leave him in your rankings where you thought he'd be before the injury so gene uh deandre swift ff in the groin so tell us possibly <laughs> not gonna play week one they said but, but, um, yeah. do we what's going on i don't know that was weird yesterday to me because you know you, you read this and dan campbell is saying i'm not exactly sure where he is but he's out there taking full reps in training camp and, and the beat writers are saying he looks okay so i'm not sure what to make of that maybe there's a little bit more concern locally in detroit among the coaching staff they actually want to see him do something because this has been a longer term injury and maybe it was a more severe situation that was initially let on um, but for him to be taking pretty much most of the first team reps over the last couple of days and, and doing well, unless something changed on Thursday, everything I read earlier in the week through Wednesday evening was reassuring for him. So another player that you'd like to see continue to be successful in consecutive practices. And if that's the case, then I think I discount a little bit of what Dan Campbell said this week. It is the audible live here. It's Cecil Lammy, Sigmund Bloom, Matt Waldman, and Dr. Gene Brammel. We'll get to the five biggest rankings changes, but we're going around the injury circle and the news and notes out there talking about guys like Saquon Barkley back in live drills. Uh, what does this mean for Barkley's availability? And do you think, like me, Dr. Gene, that Barkley will play week one but he won't get a full workload until, you know, week three, week four, something like that. Yeah, I think that was the initial expectation, and that's what the Giants had been telling us. There was an Ian Rappaport report a couple of weeks ago that said that maybe week three was the target, suggesting that he might not do anything in week one or two. And I think that had to do with, you know, the, the Giants continuing to make sure that he's ready to go. I'm not going to put a lot of stock in him not taking contact in some of the videos we've seen. Yes, he looks good, but he's looked good in whatever rehab things that have been from him running on sand to other things through the, the summer months here. So uh, it's good news that he continues to progress and that 
they're allowing him to do some of these things, but he's not taken contact yet. Uh, he has not played in any sort of risky situations over a, a consecutive snap to snap situation. And that's the next hurdle there, but it's good that they're already clearing him to do as much as possible short of taking contact this far in advance of the regular season. So he's got a couple of weeks to get there. I don't think a couple of weeks is enough for him to be taking 25 touches in week one. So I'm still sort of where you are on this. I'm glad that the progress is being made. Hopefully you see him back to a full workload sometime in September and then uh, pushes everybody aside so that he continues to take those 85, 90% of the snaps in New York moving forward. Gene, you've been very calming as always for the last couple of weeks, generally advising us, Hey, you know, until it's seven, 10 days before the season players haven't gotten reconditioned. We shouldn't worry about these injuries. Guys like Kenny Galladay, Will Fuller, you know, Marquise Brown. When do we see the sign coming up on the road that says, now it's time to get worried? Pretty much now. I don't think I ever said, don't worry about Kenny Galladay. I think from the beginning, that one, uh, even though they said two to three weeks, had the look of a, a mid-grade injury and more of a three to four plus week situation. So no surprise that he's not back on the practice field yet. Um, you know, the list of, of guys that I've already seen, I mean, we've got A.J. Brown, Julio Jones, Stephon Diggs, Will Fuller, Elijah Moore, Jonu Smith, just easy, um, quick ones that I um, noticed this week that were back to practice and a lot of, in a lot of cases back in full pads. So this is the week, again, you expect to see the case because some of these players are, are might want to take a snap or five in this final preseason game. I don't expect a lot of these players to do that necessarily. We're going to see Joe Burrow do it. We're going to see a few other players do it, but we're definitely come up to that time frame where you'd like to see them at least get back on the field and do some conditioning. Do they have to take contact this week? No, not necessarily, but I'd expect them to be able to do that next week so that teams know what they have in place to start game planning for week one. Uh, so I'm not nervous about players if they haven't come back um, to contact yet, but you'd really like to see them start the conditioning process. So um, Kenny Galladay, I, whether he's available for week one is still an open question at this point. That's going to be within the four to six week time frame, but he's already outside the two to three weeks, and that's not unexpected from what we saw in the beginning. Um, he's the one that uh, that's I wouldn't say is is expected necessarily, but all of these guys, Curtis Samuel should be coming back. I mean, the list goes on of players that, if these injuries are as minor as you as we've heard that they are, that they should be back practicing at some point in the next week. Right turn, Clyde. Right turn, Clyde. Right. <laughs> he went left. How far left has right has Cl Clyde gone? Um, I, I, I was. I think it's easy to overreact to certain types of injuries, right? So um, when you don't hear not a high ankle sprain and low ankle sprain, those sorts of things, then, you know, if it's not a low ankle sprain, you start to get a little bit nervous. So uh, when it was posted that the injury was to the inside of his ankle, uh, there's good reason to be concerned that it might be a longer term injury, but there's a wide range of possibilities with such a big ligament on that inside of the ankle. Uh, and it's not surprising to hear teams want to get an MRI. The good news here is that Clyde Edwards Hilaire was already back on the practice field the following day. He was just doing some individual stuff and walk through things. He wasn't cleared for contact, but um, you know, he wasn't in an immobilizing boot. We didn't get a big concerning MRI report after the injury there. So uh, it's still a little bit too soon to say that he's definitively going to be ready for a full workload in week one, but it really doesn't have the looks of a four to six week plus injury at this point. We're not hearing any concerns of surgery. Uh, I saw some folks, you know, rightly be concerned about the injury and bring up Michael Thomas situation, which is similar. And then that was one of the ligaments that needed to be repaired. But Thomas was dealing with a multiple ligament injury, something that didn't heal over months. You have no way of knowing 24 hours in if that was going to be the case with Edwards Hilaire. So I'm hoping that we'll see him back to practice in some form this week and that he's ready to take contact. But there's not been anything from the national media, local media, or the Chiefs themselves that suggests that this is going to be a long-term injury that's going to threaten the first month of the season for him. It is the Audible Live here Thursday night on our YouTube channel. It's youtube.com slash footballguystv. Make sure to do all those YouTube things like comment, share, subscribe, and hit that notification bell so that you never miss a vid. And thank you, Sasha. Thank you all for watching and listening. Making the rounds with Dr. Gene Brammel. And one of the news stories today on our Football Guys Newswire Dr. Gene, it was about TJ Hawkinson, a shoulder issue, a minor shoulder issue. Is it really minor? Uh, does that change your mind about Hawkinson, who I think is what, like tight end six yeah. in most fantasy traps? What do you think here? 
I don't know too much about that one yet. That must have just happened in the last 24 hours. Wasn't aware that there was anything significant. Probably a good thing because most of those things, if there's a concern from the team or anything that a beat writer um, reports, it usually comes across my uh, Twitter timeline and some of my alerts. So I haven't seen that yet. If they're saying it's minor, uh, you know, I always get a little from bit concerned. Chris Burke. About, Chris hmm? Burke. I'm looking at the story right now. Yeah, Chris Burke. I, I always get a little Twitter. bit concerned when Detroit says injuries are minor. We'll see things last a little bit longer. Um, that's something that we'll probably follow up. We've talked about Justin Jefferson, Marvin Jones now dealing with an AC sprain as well. Not saying that that's what it is, but any sort of shoulder injury can be a problem for a player that needs to extend his arms to block, a player that needs to extend his arms to catch the ball away from his body and be able to support himself when he goes to the ground to take hits. So if it's truly minor shoulder separation, what have you, those things tend to be one to three week injuries and it shouldn't affect his regular season. You've heard Justin and Jefferson say that, you know, playing with a pad and it's something that could linger, those sorts of things, but uh, wouldn't necessarily be too concerned about that until we hear that he's going to miss a significant amount of practice time or there's an imaging report that says this is more than a low grade injury. So should know more on that in the next 48 hours. Gene, we've talked about the term injury prone a lot and what it means, what it doesn't mean, whether it's real. Uh, two backs playing on the West Coast come to mind. One, Raheem Moster who left practice with his uh, back issue yesterday, back at practice today, and fine. But it's Raheem Mostert. And you wonder if his inability to stay healthy contributed to why he had to basically hold out last year, why the team drafted Trey Sermon. And then you have down in L.A., Daryl Henderson, who his thumb gets a little banged up, and, I mean, just draw a straight line to them trading for Sony Michelle. Do you think these teams see these backs as, quote, injury prone, and it affects how they use them. This is fantasy relevant. And also, you know, that inevitable other shoe dropping of the Rams trading for or acquiring in some way a veteran back. Uh, you know, do you think sometimes teams buy into the idea that players are injury prone? Yeah, I, they know whether or not a player is injury prone or not. They have a sense of how certain injuries happen, whether or not they were set up for injuries, the testing they do, the entrance physicals, the exit physicals. When I say a player, I get nervous about using the term injury prone because I just I don't have enough information. You just give me a list of injuries and say, are they injury prone? Well, they have been, but will they be in the future? I, I'm not comfortable answering that question, but um, the team has a huge medical file on each one of their players. They know when they come into camp, are they in condition or not? They know if there's a minor injury that might not get reported in the media that they need to be concerned about. Um, and they know how well a player has rehabbed in the past and how successful they've been in recovering in a, in a reasonable period of time that would be expected. So they know the answers to those questions. Certainly, they feel like some of their players may be more injury prone than others. I think these two situations are, you know, you kind of take them on a case by case basis. So I think you could make an argument in San Francisco that they chosen not to use Raheem Mostert because they think he's going to be an important part of the offense and they don't want to risk any minor dings that might cost him some time. Or you could make the argument that, yeah, they're worried that these things may come up. They want him to be a part of the offense until Trey Sermon maybe proves otherwise. And San Francisco has always been a team that um, is, is willing to use a number of their backs on the roster. So uh, trying to get into the mind of kind of uh, of Kyle Shanahan's a little bit difficult there. Uh, but I, I think you can go in both directions there. The fact that Mostert is back to practice after a day off tells you that they're ready for him to start preparing himself to be in condition to take whatever workload they want him to in the beginning of the year. Um, Daryl Henderson, they're just, you know, whatever you think of Xavier Jones and, and the rest of that depth chart, there really wasn't a lot behind Henderson there. Um, lots of folks have been concerned about Henderson's injury history. This thumb sprain did didn't seem to be a major issue at all. It was called a mild sprain. There were no long-term concerns. He was back on the field for individual drills the next day. Um, so it doesn't seem to be an issue going forward. But when you say draw the line from one to the other, I think there was every reason to think that Los Angeles, had they had a chance to do so through cuts or otherwise, was probably going to bring somebody else in there just because of the way their depth chart looked, period. Um, and then, you know, maybe even after they found out that some sprains wasn't a big idea, a big deal to go ahead and pick somebody up makes a total sense there. So I don't know that either team see those players as injury prone, uh, but some of the actions that they're taking um, show their level of concern with what the running back situation looks like there. So I think I'm not hearing anything about either one of those players that puts them in jeopardy for week one. We'll see how Trey Sermon gets used in the last couple of weeks. We'll see what becomes of Sony Michelle and what the Rams have to say about him to get a, a sense of what that week one and beyond usage will be for those players. I like the idea of a two tight end offense in New England with Mac Jones more than Cam Newton. So tell us a little bit more about Hunter Henry and, and his injury and whether or not 
we should be concerned about drafting him as a late round pick. And he's on mute. Oh shoot! I've been doing so well for so long. <laughs> <laughs> we uh, so what I had said was because he's a late round pick, I don't think you need to be too concerned about that. We're not going to get a lot of information about New England. We're hearing a little bit about the injury and that it's enough to keep him out of practice. But is this a true two to three week situation? Is this New England being cautious as they often are with some of their uh, key players or players that they think would like to have a role or because just everybody on their tight end list has been injured recently and they want to make sure they have as many healthy bodies for week one as possible. We're going to learn the answer to that in the next seven to 10 days when, again, we hit that all important time. If you're going to be ready for week one, we need to know right now. So that time is coming from Henry. I haven't heard anything that makes me think he's going to be on injured reserve to start the season, but we'll see how that progresses in the next few days. Thursday night is about the Audible Live here, youtube.com slash TV. Everyone, thanks for watching. Dr. Gene Bramble, we'll go another round with you here. And I want to ask you about Josh Allen, who's set to play on Saturday in the Bills preseason finale. Does Sean McDermott need his head exam? <laughs> uh, you guys remind me, I'm fairly certain that Buffalo's offensive line is strong, Yes. Well, yeah. yes, and he hasn't played, though. Allen didn't yeah. play in the first two preseason games. I'm like, yeah. the, the plan was not to play him at all. Oh, well, So I think, and this goes to back the Joe Burrow question as well, I think if a player goes to the coach and says, I need a couple of preseason reps to feel comfortable at snap one, week one, then there's a discussion that needs to be had from the coaching staff and, and where we are. And Joe Burrow didn't play in the first couple of weeks because the offensive line really wasn't there for Cincinnati yet. And I think some of those guys are getting healthy enough to where you'll do what you need to do. And I don't think Allen is going to be put in any position at all to be sitting back there in the pocket or to be allowed to scramble or anything else. He's going to be told get into the rhythm of the offense a little bit, hand the ball off a couple of times. Maybe we'll do a couple of quick hitting passes. And in the worst case scenario is somebody trips you when you're stepping away from under center. Um, and that may not even happen if he's back in shotgun. So I don't think any of these players are going to get anything in the quarterbacks in particular are going to be put in a situation where they can actually be hit, including Joe Burrow. Um, and, you know, players being what they are, you know, maybe they make a decision in the moment where they try to extend a play or something like that. But I think it's going to be a condition of him suiting up for that final preseason game that he does absolutely nothing that puts him in harm's way. And the play calling is going to be consistent with that as well. Gene, season's almost here. Fantasy football drafts upon us. Uh, football, for better or for worse, is always a release, always an escape. And I just want to ask you, because we all need the escape now, what are you looking forward to about this season? What excites you when you know that football is soon to be back? No, I just as I always tell you guys, I, I like the stories. I know you are the mayor of Narrative Street, as you like to say, but um, I like watching the good players do well. Uh, hopefully, I'm looking forward to a relatively quiet season for injuries. I know better than to expect that to happen necessarily, but um, I want to see all of the best players out there performing, and I don't have anything specific I'm looking forward to, but I'll be happy if I'm uh, if I have the time to sit in front of the Red Zone channel and, and pay attention to what's going on this year. And learn a new okra uh, recipe. <laughs> That'd be fine, too. See, see, there you go. I don't really have another question, but I'll figure one out. How about this? Um, <laughs> Emmanuel Sanders, day-to-day, -day, limited foot injury. Any real concerns about him long-term? I don't think so. Well, let's pause there for a second. Emmanuel Sanders, years and years ago, had a couple of issues with his Jones fracture, right? So whenever I hear foot and Manny Sanders, you know, your ears at least perk up a little bit. Could this be an issue? But that's so remote now. That goes back to his Pittsburgh days where, you know, you got to think twice about it. I'm not saying it has anything to do with those injuries back then, or it might be having an issue with the surgical repair there that could crop up. But They've allowed him to essentially take some veteran days and he's been back to practice. He's not a player that has missed multiple days of practice and we're wondering whether or not it's rest or something more. So the fact that he's been practicing more often than not does not give me too much pause with him this year. I know you touched on it, Dr. Gene, but Eric brings it up in the chat room. AJ Brown knee concerns? Um, yes, but no. I, I, I'm never 
excited to see players miss a long amount of practice time, especially somebody that's had a couple of arthroscopic procedures. What we didn't hear is that he had knee swelling or soreness that was limiting him a little bit. Now, I imagine they would have allowed him practice if that was the case, but there's been all sorts of stuff going on with Tennessee from COVID-related issues for ongoing weeks now. They haven't put Julio Jones on the practice field at all until this week either. Uh, the first day they cleared A.J. Brown to return, he was in pads doing a lot of strenuous conditioning and drills. So I, I think it's just a situation where there wasn't any reason for them to be anything but cautious. And now again, we're hitting that 10 to 14 day mark where it's time to make sure you're truly in football condition. Maybe we can give you a little bit of contact here in practice, if not the preseason game. I don't think that's likely to happen, but he should be good. And that is Dr. Gene Brammel here joining us on the Audible Live. Dr. Gene, as always, appreciate your time, brother. Stay frosty and be good. I will try, and I'll do my best to stay off mute next week. See y'all. <laughs> the guy messes up once, and he's like, oh, it's never again. Like, uh, who was it earlier? Uh, Freddie, I think. Like, this is like a fantasy football Mensa meeting. And I was like, well, what the hell am I doing here then? Uh, but either way, Matt Waldman, Sigma Bloom, no game update. Exactly. No, no uh, game update tonight, Bloom. So let's no. talk about the game within the game mm -hmm. that happened this week. And so God blessed, thankful that the Broncos made a decision on quarterback and they made it to Teddy Sutton's going to play. I haven't seen Sutton go vertical. Like I've said, everyone a million times. This is big news for Judy, but how big in your eyes? And since our topic is top five biggest yeah. rank movements, blah, blah, flipper, how much are you moving Judy up with this news? Not much, really. I think that we were looking at him being a primary receiver in this offense. Like you said before, he didn't have great chemistry with Drew Locke. But I also never thought Locke would hold on to the job, even if he got it to open the season. And I feel like he was one demotion away from really becoming a true backup quarterback. I mean, I think by not starting him week one, especially, you see that. And we can get into a deeper discussion there. I would say Judy's a sixth or seventh round pick. I'm not sure I would take him over, say, Robbie Anderson. Um, I wouldn't, I'm not sure I would take him over Tyler Boyd. Uh, I, I suppose you could take Judy because they're he's going to go earlier than Boyd and try to get both of them. Uh, you know, I still think that this Denver offense is not going to be exciting. It's not going to create overachievers, big overachievers in the passing game. And I think it's going to be a conservative as it, well, it should be. That's why Teddy fits, right? The first three games right. of the season are, they should be three and O something's wrong. If they're not three and O after they face the giants, the Jags and the jets. And you, hopefully he doesn't turn the ball over. You play good defense, you win those games easily, and you, the die is cast for the offense the rest of the year. Matt, let's talk about this because I was actually writing earlier today about Josh Palmer. Um, you know, there was a news item about Josh Palmer kind of, you know, getting the back pocket of Keenan Allen and all that sort of stuff. And the thing with Palmer is you knew he had it. He just didn't have good quarterback play at Tennessee. Nice size, speed combo. You can comment on him if you'd like, Matt. But I want to tie this into Jerry Judy because the – role of precision and timing with a wide receiver that he himself is precise and timing. Sutton's the guy that, you know, is playing pick up basketball and throw it up and let the big man go get it. That's Sutton's game. And that fits with Locke's game, which is like scramble around. Don't make pre-snap reads. Don't read the defense. Generally don't know what you're doing and then throw it up and let the big man go get it. Teddy is on time, on rhythm, good pass placement. How does that help excel and accelerate what we see from Jerry Judy. Oh, I think it's a perfect fit because what you're looking for here is that Judy's the type of receiver who's going to be able to buy open windows after the first break. So he's going to be able to break across the field, find that second and third opening in zone, or be able to work back to the quarterback in a way where he's savvy about being on the same page with his passer. And to be on the same page with your passer, not only does the receiver have to understand the defense, but the quarterback has to understand the defense. So now he's with a quarterback that one of the most underrated traits about Fred, Teddy Bridgewater is the ability to avoid the first man in pressure and to find that second or third window with a receiver. So Judy's a natural fit for that. So for me, I have Judy elevated from that 900-yard mark to the 1,100-yard mark. I don't think the touchdowns are going to go up at all. I have him at four touchdowns. I have him just above Tyler Boyd 
as his absolute ceiling. Um, but again, he's not in my, you know, he's not really in my top 20 right now in terms of um, fantasy receivers um, at this stage. But still, he's a solid starter for you who has the upside to be on the low end of that top 20 as a wide receiver too. And it, and this was something that we all kind of talked about from the beginning of the camp, which is that if Drew Locke won, Cortland Sutton wins. If Teddy Bridgewater wins, you know, then it was going to be Jerry Judy. And I think it makes sense. That it was a little surprising to me that this happened only because I presumed that Denver, was, because of its investment in Locke, would give him a shot early in the season and then go to Teddy Bridgewater halfway through if Locke didn't show any type of improvement. But what it shows you is when we look back on it, we understand that Fangio's trying to save his job. This is his last-ditch effort to be able to do that. The the Aaron Rodgers trade didn't go through, so their chance to try and really excel didn't work out. And so now it's like, my best shot to save my job is Teddy Bridgewater, and it's very clear because Drew's too late in trying to do all the things that he needs to do to become better. And now he's just trying to salvage a career as a journeyman who might attract the eye of somebody to become a starter down the line. Just keep working with Peyton Manning. That's what my right. suggestion would be. Right. And, like, and don't so make Peyton be the one to uh, to go to you. Yeah. That's yeah. what happened. And Peyton, yeah. Peyton probably – Peyton was probably bored sitting on the toilet being like, you know what? I haven't talked to Drew in a while. I'm going to reach out to Drew Locke. And he's the one that instigated it. Yeah. So, then, hey, Locke, Peyton lives here. Go see him. Yeah. Like, be annoying. To the point of being annoying. Yeah. Like, basically, yeah. yeah. I mean, show that you really want it. But if you have a big contract already – and you're going to get to make a living without getting hit most of the time for the next, you know, seven to 10 years, possibly because of what you do, you, you know, that might be an attitude too, that he might have right, and, and right. bless him. If that's what he wants, you know, then he can go into real estate after that. That's uh, something like that. Uh, I, I don't want to turn this into Denver sports talk radio. That's coming up in half an hour on the fan. It's Nick at Cecil. Uh, I, I, I won't spoil anything. Uh, and, and I definitely could. Uh, that's an inside joke. Nobody's going to get it for another couple of weeks. But anyway, uh, Bloom, super, super quick, like super quick. Yeah. Can Judy do at least what Robbie Anderson did last year with Teddy feeding right. the rock? Yeah, it, I think so. I mean, I think he could be a consistent wide receiver, three, five for 55, six for 67 kind of receiver for sure. Uh, I, I think that it, He's doing that, and he's moving the chains. You know, Brandon McManus, don't turn the ball over, play good defense, and this team is going to try to be a wild card, but as Matt laid it out, you know, it's trying to win your, save your job, and that's not that's not offensive genius or imagination. <laughs> right. Okay, Bloom, the Travis Etienne injury. Mm -hmm. What does it say for James Robinson? Yeah. We're talking about movers in drafts, and, and also that means overreaction. We're, we're talking right. proper movement. And then we're talking about people overreacting. Now Carlos Hyde's going to become a, a tenth round pick in some drafts or whatever, you know, handcuff. What's this do for Visca? Uh, I, I think it opens up a lot of different things. Yeah, this is big. Um, it, how do we feel about people that believed in James Robinson probably being the biggest winners of the preseason? That's cool, right? I mean, I think that's pretty cool because yeah. you you have uh, from all directions this uh, a, a siege saying James Robinson, undrafted free agent, it just can't last. It won't last. Philip Lindsay, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? And then they draft Travis Etienne. It's like, see, that that's it. It was just that short lived for him. But he's been getting the first carry, the first snap in practice every week, every I mean, every day. So he was the number one running back for this team already. And really, this is more the H-back role, and that's why you're absolutely right to bring up Visca because he has a skill set to play outside, but he also has a skill set to play that H-back role. And at the very least, it gives them more of an impetus to use him creatively. Or, in the course, we bring up injury-prone, you know, maybe border on overusing him. But Robinson was the seventh, eighth-round pick and now you can lay out the running backs, okay? After your top five, that's the top five in every draft. And then my next group is Chubb, Eckler, and Aaron Jones. And then it's my next group. These are your, your late first, early second round if you're lucky running backs. Because I just I know what those guys are, man. And I know what those offenses are, 
Like, I, well, Joe Lombardi, we'll see. But the point is, Eckler, Jones, and Chubb, like, I feel super confident in them. Now, after that, you've got Mixon, Gibson, Najee Harris, Saquon Barkley. I suppose Jonathan Taylor is a little more stable now that it looks like Carson Wentz is going to play week one. Clyde Edwards Elaire, who we already talked about on the show, um, J.K. Dobbins, Chris Carson. And J- I would can make an argument for Robinson just about anywhere in there, right? I mean, I could make an argument for Robinson in the second round with Najee Harris. Uh, so I think that if you can get Robinson in the third round right now, that feels good. The only real risk here is that Urban Meyer forces Carlos Hyde onto the field too much. And that has been in a storyline when we think of Carlos Hyde fantasy we have that early promising part of his career with 49ers and since then he's been more of a obstruction to value than someone that actually created any value of his own so I suppose I can buy into that and then just the Jags offense going to be okay the Jags offense has not looked good okay I think Andy Staples that who it was that said if the you better hope the Jags haven't unveiled their offense because if this is the offense it's (laughs) no you know no bueno no. So we'll see. It could be a rocky ride. You want to say after what we've seen in Jacksonville the last two years, it can't get worse on offense. Uh, so I add all these things up. I still think it's difficult to see Robinson any worse off than he was last year. And I, again, the bottom line here is already the fantasy gods have spoken. The good karma goes to people who believed in James Robinson. Matt, is Urban Meyer going to write a Dear John letter like Bobby Petrino did years ago and just walk? I, I, this isn't going to end well. I, again, I, this isn't Jacksonville sports talk either. Forgive me. I, I go into that mode. But, like, Urban Mind, this isn't going to last. I should have known that from day one. It's a good question for sure, and we're going to find out. And certainly there's a report today that players aren't happy. Some players aren't happy there on the team. Now, I haven't read the report to know what that actually says, but I can say that uh, – well, I have a you feeling know, that you could uh, you could pick up the phone and call some people down there and find out. <laughs> I'll say this. Um, it was a huge question mark that they drafted Etienne in the first place. And I'm happy for I, – I want And what Etienne, a Tony, by the way. Yeah, Etienne I'm, as an alternative to Tony. Yeah, right. Now, Etienne is a, is a player that I'm rooting for. You don't ever want to see a guy not, not work out due to injury. Um, so I hope the best for him – over the course of his career. But my initial reaction was uh, it doesn't make any sense to have him as an every down back because James Robinson is clearly the better back. I mean, clearly the better back. Etienne is basically an incarnation better than Tevin Coleman when Tevin Coleman entered the league. And Tevin Coleman was a borderline trash, to be honest, at that at the point that he was. He was fast and needed a compass to figure out where to go. Um, <laughs> so, you, you know, when you look at, and he learned to his credit. So Etienne probably will too, because Etienne has shown development over the course of his career. But Robinson did this with Gardner Minshew, a weak armed, you know, late draft pick on a bad offensive line with a trash defense. And he played that well. And he played well enough that the old NFR guard, they had to literally ask for permission to, to let him compete with Leonard Fournette, even though it was clear that they they could let Leonard Fournette out the door once they did give um, Robinson that opportunity. This guy's for real. He can play football. So I'm in a way, I'm happy for him to get his shot again. And I, I don't I don't know about the offense. Um, I think that really when we look at this at at a certain level, we'll put it this way. Chris Fowler on ESPN said, I think I just have this gut feeling that the league's going to figure out Lamar Jackson this year. And Chris Brown, the great Chris Brown wrote last week, figure out the league figured out Lawrence Taylor. Did that help? They figured out Earl (laughs) Campbell. Did that help? I'm like, and I wrote back and I'm like, yeah, there's one thing to like know what a team does. And it's another thing to execute against them. The fact is, is that even without the execution last year uh, with a line that could have been executed and probably would have played better as a zombie unit in certain aspects and with a quarterback who really wasn't all that good james robinson was awesome so now they have trevor lawrence and maybe yeah they have a scheme that might that might muck things up but he can run he can run better and he can throw better and he has better receivers this year so for for my 
for my money, I, I'm with Bloom in that next tier in the second round. If you're not considering James Robinson, um, it's only because you're super conservative about wanting to have great offensive lines when you draft early. And my rule, kind of my rule of thumb is you draft great talents with great offensive lines as your first priority. And then after that, if you have a proven guy who can produce consistently week to week with a bad offensive line, I'll take that over a highly talented guy who, in terms of athletic talent, who doesn't have a good offensive line, but one week he has 120 yards and the next week he has three. Mm, the Audible Live here Thursday night, youtube.com slash TV. Hey, you love the show? show? You want to support the show? I want to learn how to speak English on a weekly basis because it's kind of my job. Uh, so support the show by going to footballguys.com. There's the orange button in the upper right-hand corner. It says join now. Uh, join us and subscribe to footballguys.com. It's the best way to support this show other than liking, commenting, sharing, and subscribing and hitting the notification bell and also making sure that you're still subscribed because YouTube like unsubscribes. I have channels, you know, obviously comic book channels that I watch and I'll be like, I haven't seen a video from those guys in a while. And there's like 10 videos that I missed out on because YouTube unsubscribed me because of reasons. Hashtag our YouTube overlords. It's probably because I cussed on the air. Uh, Bloom, let's tie a bow on tonight's show talking about Sony Michelle, man. Mm -hmm. How excited are you for this move? I think it's a good move. I think it's a really good move for the Rams and for the Patriots. They don't need him. They like Ramondre Stevenson. But again, Sony Michelle, I think he resumed. He didn't quite get back to, if you could picture the best case scenario for Sony Michelle based on what we saw at Georgia, he's never going to hit it because of his knees, but he hasn't had the chronic knee problems lately. He looked good, especially in the second half of the year last year. By all accounts, he looked good in camp this year. And what's potentially exciting here is the Rams running game. And I keep coming back to CJ Anderson. Yeah. See, I really hope we should. You should have a calendar behind you that says days since we mentioned CJ Anderson. <laughs> you know, and we just need to make sure we right. never let it get more than like ninety or a hundred. You know, right, just right. for whatever reason. And I think we remember CJ Anderson in twenty eighteen, his last great glory. You know, he went out with a streak of glory in fantasy football. Also, I think it was week sixteen, right? Yep. Again. Good karma for people that trusted C.J. Anderson. That's something that is in the DNA of this show. And you think about Daryl Henderson running through those holes. That's why we were so excited. Didn't really happen in his rookie year. Then they draft Cam Akers. Sony Michelle is the kind of running back that makes coaches sleep at night, sleep well at night. Daryl Henderson is the kind of running back that makes coaches trade for a running back like Sony Michelle. And I like Daryl Henderson. I think Henderson and Mostert are very analogous. They have that home run speed, but they also aren't reliable running backs in the way that coaches like their running backs to be. So I think this is going to be something close to a committee. I think that even though people associate injury prone more with Michelle, I think Michelle's more likely to get starts because of injury than Henderson. Right. And, uh, you know, it, it's weird that we're talking about Sonny Michel as a running back on the rise. But in the second half of drafts, I like uh, Giovanni Bernard and James White a lot, especially in PPR leagues. And then you're just talking about backup running backs. You're just taking backup running backs, basically, and hoping for an injury. You're not really hoping for an injury, but I'm saying that's how the value could potentially be realized. And Sonny Michel is somebody now that jumps to the front of that line. Uh, you know, Even ahead of guys like, I don't know, Alexander Madison. You know, after... Pollard and Dylan go off the board. Michelle should be on your mind. And I think it's a, a move that, and, and hey, on the Patriot side, you know, they kind of shanked a first round pick on Sony Michelle, but at least they get something out of it at the end. And, you know, we're seeing Belichick churn that roster, get value. They traded for Sean Wade today. That was an interesting one. The Ravens also churning the roster, depth at cornerback. So the good stay good by developing the roster from the bottom up. Mm, Matt, let's talk about this and why uh, Sony Michelle probably called up DeAndre Swift. Say, hey, tell me about this guy Stafford. I think this is great for Michelle. I think he gets a thousand yards for the first time in his career. Which, by the way, it's four years, but still, Mark Ingram didn't have a thousand yards until what year six, whatever the number was. Like, yeah, Michelle, go. This is great for him. There's a certain possibility that this could exactly be what you guys are forecasting here, 
And Michelle, when he is healthy and at his best, um, you know, he's capable of being an all around back guy who can catch out of the backfield, who can block for you, runs off up the middle and have the burst to get you outside and play in the open field. Um, I'm not with you guys, though, on this particular one. Um, I actually think that the take that Daryl Henderson is injury prone is just really more of a bad label for a back who they just see as smaller and lighter and just decided that they're just going to go with that and mistake that for injury prone or fear of injury prone. Um, when it comes to, to him, he's played in the league two years. One of those years he didn't understand the system because, you know, the Rams were dumb enough to draft a back like the Seattle Seahawks do year after year after year, <laughs> which is let's get a gap style runner when we run zone. You know, which that's worked out with Tevin Coleman in Atlanta. It worked out with Rashad Penny. Worked out with CJ Procise. You know, it takes two, three years for those guys to get started. What good are you going to have with a back like that? Because, you know, they think backs are instinctive and they don't understand what they are. So now Henderson gets it. Henderson actually outproduced Cam Akers in efficiency last year. In a lot of efficiency metrics when you take a look at what he did. Watching him on film, I thought he was the smarter runner. I thought he showed functional power between the tackles. He's got more big play ability, that's for sure, when he gets in the open field. And while I think Cam Akers has better hands, I think Daryl Henderson actually runs better routes. Um, but the problem is, is Sean McVay has in his head that he wants a bigger back. Um, so do I think that's going to play out this year? I think Sony Michelle, we haven't seen him run outside zone. Georgia runs a lot more inside zone than outside zone. The Patriots certainly don't run outside zone. Um, so I'm interested to see how they're, they may use him on selected plays. And I'm a little worried about the um, offensive line. I think Daryl Henderson squeezes through smaller gaps better. And that's what they, they run a lot of duo and duo or small gap plays. And he does well with that. So I actually see this as, and I'll, and saying all this, Sony Michelle was the second player on my list of players back in late July that I mentioned in an article covering the Rams backfield of football guys saying, if they're going to trade for someone, Michelle's one of the two backs, two highest backs on my list who make the most sense to have from a perspective of contract and talent. But I see this more as a, as a indictment of Daryl Jones. I'm Xavier Jones as knowing assignments as a pass protector um, and someone they can rely on to get tough yards. So I, the way I have this laid out, I, I actually see this as a situation where, at best, it's Daryl Henderson as a low-end running back, too, um, and Sonny Michelle basically as maybe an occasional flex play. Um, at worst for Daryl Henderson, it's a complete muck of a situation for both players, and you might as well just go ahead and not draft either one of them. Take Deshaun, Watts, Deshaun Jackson as your last pick and enjoy the two games that he has where he's healthy and gives you about 60 points in those two games <laughs> and then ditch him on the waiver wire for the next hot back on the waiver wire who comes up right. due to an injury. So windows, windows, windows to the soul. By the way, Zara wanted to talk about Tony Jones, Bloom. Do you know yeah. where I saw Tony Jones? What, at the Shrine game? I saw him at the Shrine game. And home, uh, let's, let's uh, if I, w I wish I could cuss. I yeah. wish I could cuss because this kid, uh, you want to wind him up and let him go, right? As, as far as being not necessarily a slasher, in my opinion, but just a guy that's going to take what the defense gives you, run through tackles if he can, and, and is hard charging. A little bit reminiscent of when I saw James Robinson at the Shrine Bowl as well. And because we talk about windows, just super quick, Bloom, as we wrap up the show, because I'm on the air in 10 minutes, um, the like that's the type of guy that we will all be talking about on the waiver wire. Like something hits, he might unseat Latavius Murray. That's the yeah. word down there in New Orleans. Exactly. That's the thing. And we liked Murray. So if Jones gets Murray's role, we like Jones. And the Saints and undrafted running backs, just the Saints and undrafted players in general. Right. Uh, again, teams building the roster from the bottom up. So, yeah, absolutely, Tony Jones it fits in that. 12th round and later and remember once it's the 12th round and later who cares about trying to time picks just take the players you like best every you know once you're at that point just take players good offenses good players and see what happens mm, matt super quick uh tony jones scouting report please 
Um, honestly, I don't really remember a lot about him right now to be able to, to give you a good one. I know he's out of Notre Dame. I think he had some decent quickness. He was someone that had decent footwork. Um, I don't remember much about him as a receiver, but he has good size to break tackles. I do want to bring up one quick thing uh, with this. You mentioned Zara, who's on the show here. And Zara, I hope mm -hmm. you're okay with me mentioning this, but I want to tout something that he's come up with that's called um, – that that's called basically a it's a game script report that he's going to be doing with specific players each week Ooh. that I just want to tout that does looks at snaps utilization game script and fantasy points and you know keep an eye out that on Twitter um, from from Zara it's going to be interesting I'll certainly tweet it out when he makes it public but I've gotten a, a nice look at it I know Bloom has as well um, so you know I want to allow people to get their eyes on that because it looks like something that could be very very promising for people when they want to do their analysis matt may ride a bass solo to it yeah z bass solo take one by the way to follow sorry it's z cant k-a-n-t-z-f-f -F on twitter there you go there it is and matt i seriously want you to listen to anesthesia pulling teeth as soon as we're done with the show because it's cliff burton's bass solo Okay. So you're learning bass. <laughs> Learn of RIP to Cliffy Burton. RIP to Cliffy Burton. So anesthesia, pulling teeth. And uh, that is a wrap for tonight's program. He's Sigma Bloom. He's Matt Waldman. Follow us all on Twitter. It's the most important thing ever. And make sure to subscribe to footballguys.com to support the show. We really appreciate you guys. Thanks much. Love you all. Peace out. Stay tuned and stay frosty.